Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Johnson Glock. That's wonderful. I apologize to him and to you. I thought Brother Chris was going to do an instrumental before Brother Johnson sang, and uh, I got it wrong. So, uh, but he did a great job anyway, didn't he? Amen. I ask you to take your Bible now, if you will, and turn with me to the book of First John. First John and chapter three. First John chapter three. We are going to read the first three verses of this chapter. And then uh, I'm just going to talk to you for a little bit, and then we'll get back into the scripture. So please, after we read the initial time, uh, please keep your Bible open, and uh, we'll be following along uh, in the scriptures. First John was written by the Apostle John and written to new believers. Throughout the book of First John, he uses the name, My Little Children, or Little Children. And he's talking to not just four or five year olds, though they're certainly worth talking to uh, and listening to for that matter. But um, he's talking to young ones in the faith, little children in the faith, those who have recently been born again and have not had the time and opportunity for a great spiritual growth. And so uh, we encourage you to keep that in mind as we look at the Father's love. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth, not, knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself as he is pure. Go back to verse 1, if you would. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. What a wonderful example, what a wonderful truth we have in the Father's love. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for your word. Ask that you send your sweet and blessed Holy Spirit to work in our hearts tonight, to this day. And Lord, to guide us into all truth. Help us to see, know, and understand exactly the message that you have for the church in this hour. And Lord, if there's anyone listening who doesn't know you as Savior, may they open their heart and trust Jesus to save them and come to know what it means to truly be a child of God and to call you rightfully our Heavenly Father. Now direct in what we do, help us to make the message clear and plain. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So Father's Day, by the way, I, I should have said this during announcement, I didn't. If you're here today and you're a father, and a number of you are, we have a gift for you after the service. So don't, don't leave till you get your gift. Uh, it's it's not uh, it's not a thousand dollar check or anything like that. Uh, we, we're not giving out stimulus money, but uh, the truth of the matter is we do have a gift that we want to give you just in honor of Father's Day. And uh, so please don't leave, gentlemen, until you receive your gift. By the way, let's do this. How many how many dads do we have in the room today? I know we have a few. Stand up if you're a dad. Stand up. Stand up. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Let's give him a hand, huh? Okay, all right, we won't make you work, gentlemen. You can have a seat. Do appreciate you. It's a simple commandment. But even though it's a simple commandment, that doesn't mean that it's always easy to keep. Charles Spurgeon said, train up a child in the way he should go, but be sure you're going that way yourself. Do you understand what he's saying? A proverb says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. There's great truth in that. I took a class in college in biblical poetry where we studied Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And our teacher, professor in that class was an excellent, excellent teacher. And uh, he shared with us that verse a lot of folks misunderstand. He said, it says, train up a child in the way he should go, teach them the right way. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. He said, that doesn't mean 
that child will never depart. Doesn't mean they'll never go astray because the word there means when he is old, he'll not depart from it. In other words, when he gets well up in years, that teaching you gave him will come back to him and he'll be back where he ought to be. That's the promise, not, not a promise that you teach your child right, they'll never go astray. Uh, I've known too many, too many good men, men who love the Lord, men who serve the Lord with all their heart, both in the ministry and out, whose children did go astray. And you can say all kinds of things and form all kinds of opinions that you want to, but let me ask you a question. Is God a heavenly father? Yes or no? Yes. Do any of God's children ever go astray? Okay. Do you think God's a bad father? No. Okay. I rest my case. All right. Now, not saying that we are all perfect fathers. Far from it. Again, what Spurgeon said, train up a child in the way he should go. Be sure you're going that way. So what is this simple commandment that we have? We referred to a while ago. It's this. Honor thy father. The whole purpose of Father's Day is to obey that commandment to honor your father. I, I realize there's an echo here this morning. I'm sorry about that. We've been working on it. Those of us who are fathers, I'm sorry to say, we're not always as honorable as we should be. We have our faults. We have our failures. We make mistakes. And sometimes we just flatter wrong. My, my old man never admitted he was wrong. Well, he may not have admitted it, but that doesn't change things much. So how do we honor our fathers when our fathers fall short of being honorable? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something with you. I've shared it in previous years, but I kind of just told it to you in my own words. I want you to hear it in the original words. This is not from Scripture. This is from a man who was... Uh, Famous to a large degree, but not everybody would know his name. Uh, but he, he had a, a good amount of fame. And he was primarily a storyteller. Now, some people called him a comedian, and I understand that because a lot of his stories were funny. No question about that. But sometimes the things he told weren't funny, but they were good. I want to share this one with you. As I said, I've, I've told you about it before, but I want you to hear it in his own words. This is from a man named Jerry Clower who lived from 1926 to 1998, and he was a professional storyteller. But listen to what he says here, a bit of testimony from his own life. And these are his words as closely as I can possibly give them, and so the grammar and everything is his, not mine. Understand that. He said, when I was a little boy, my daddy couldn't handle having a teenage wife and two small boys during the Depression. There was no jobs, and he left. And one day, I was sitting in the house, and I'm complaining about my daddy's gone. We don't have enough to eat. And Aunt Corindy Lacken was over at my house helping my mama iron. And I will never forget she could barely read and write. Main thing she knew about God is what happened in her own heart. And I'm talking bad about my daddy. And Aunt Corindy turned and took her long finger and said, Boy, the Bible says honor your father and your mother. They the ones that birthed you. If you don't, it don't say nothing about honoring your father if he don't drink whiskey. Or honor your father if he ain't done left. It says, honor your father and your mama. they the ones that birthed you. When I was a sophomore at Mississippi State, what Aunt Corindy Lacken told me, it kept gnawing at me. And I caught a train and went to St. Louis, Missouri and found my daddy. And me and him had a wonderful relationship for 20 years before he died. And it was an uneducated, illiterate, decent, beautiful person gave me some advice and said, honor your father and your mother. I think that says it pretty well, to tell you the truth. I, I, I couldn't say it better. 
We're not always honorable, those of us who are fathers. I think most of us try to be. But God says, honor your father and your mother. But why? Why did God tell us to honor our fathers when he knew that we're not going to be perfect? Fathers aren't going to be perfect. He knew that some of us are going to mess up. And he knew that there would be some who just would neglect their duties. Like the one we, I just read you about. Just walked away when things were hard. I don't honor that aspect. I had a young man come to me years ago. And he said to me, he says, I, I'm, I'm trying to be a Christian. He said, the Bible says honor my father. My father is not an honorable man. I knew his father. And the boy was right. His father was not an honorable man. He had done some things no man ought to do. The young man's question to me was, how do I honor my father? Well, I think Jerry Clower's answer was pretty good. But why did God tell us to honor our fathers when we're not always who we ought to be? Well, let me share a couple of thoughts with you. And hope you still have your Bible open. We're getting there. Number one, God created us in his own image. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So your parents are created in the image of God. That's number one reason to honor them. Yeah, but everybody's created in the image of God, right? Well, are you saying we ought to honor everybody? Yes. Did you know the Bible says that too? Peter writes and he says, honor all men. Well, what about the women? Yeah, the women too, okay. He was using men in the gen generic sense of mankind. So number one, honor your father because he's created in the image of God. Honor your mother because she's created in the image of God. Number two, God wants us to see him as our father. God wants us to see him as our father. Did not Jesus teach us to pray like this? Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, you know the rest. How did Jesus tell us to pray? Our Father, which is in heaven. How are we supposed to see God as our heavenly Father? So there's a sense in which our earthly fathers are a picture of or represent our heavenly Father. Now, we've already acknowledged that too often we men mar that image. But God is gracious and forgiving and he will forgive those who receive the Lord Jesus by faith in his death for their sin. His resurrection is the guarantee of eternal life. He'll do that. And as God forgives us, he says we should also forgive. So God wants us to honor our fathers. Number one, because they're creating the image of God. Number two, because they are a picture in our relationship with him. Now let me help you with something. And men... Take this as a challenge because it's meant to be one. Many people, perhaps not everybody, but many people formulate their image of God based on their image of their own father. Now, it's not strange or unusual or unnatural that they should do that because the truth of the matter is God structured it that way. We mentioned this not long ago. The family is a picture of the Trinity with God being represented, the father being represented by the father and the family, the children representing the children or the son of God, and the wife and the mother representing the Holy Spirit. You know, I read this once in a, a book that was a very good book, and it said, you know, one of the things the wife and the mother does in the home is she sets the atmosphere in the home. And that's true. That's true to a large degree. So why do you say to a large degree? Why don't you say it's always true? Well, there's exceptions to almost everything some homes don't have a mother in them some homes uh, mother's gone 
often not through any fault of her own. But generally speaking, the mother and the wife sets the atmosphere in the home. And so the family itself was designed by God to be a picture of the Trinity. So I want us to take a look at, and I want us to try to understand God's love because God wants us to honor our fathers because of the love that he, God, has for us as our Heavenly Father. Again, please keep your Bible open. We're coming back to that text. In 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, you needn't turn there. We, we, we're not going to go there long. But in that verse, 1 Samuel 13, 14, the Lord calls David a man after his own heart. You know, that's a title that nobody else in the Bible gets. There's nobody else that God called a man after his own heart. Oh, David must have been a pretty exceptional man. David was an exceptional man. No question about it. David wrote many of the Psalms. He, he was also called the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was a shepherd who became a soldier who became a king. He was successful in many areas of his life. But was David successful as a father? He was successful as a shepherd. He was successful as a soldier. He was successful as a king. He united Israel together. They had been divided. He pulled them together. But was he successful as a father? Well, now, listen. David had 20 sons and one daughter. I imagine she either got spoiled rotten or felt very neglected. I'm not sure which. But he had 20 sons and one daughter. David for all of his good points, and he had them. For all of his leadership, and he had it. For all of his strength, and he had it. He had strength. For all of that, he was not a perfect man. And his sons were certainly not perfect. One of David's sons rebelled against him and tried to dethrone him and take over the kingdom. One of them was a rapist. One of them was a murderer. One of them was known for his wisdom, but even he had his heart turned away from God. And we have a record of the death of four of David's sons. But in all of this, hear me, David loved his children. Was he the best dad? No. Let me ask you something. You grew up in David's house. There could be many reasons why he wasn't the best dad to you. Maybe he was busy being king. Or maybe he was busy out fighting wars. Maybe he was busy running a country. That's not an excuse for neglect at home. Maybe you got spoiled because you were the king's children. Maybe you were too used to having your way and having other people do what you wanted just because you wanted it. There could be a lot of reasons why David's children didn't turn out well. But I'm telling you, David still loved his children. How do you know that? Because he wept over them. He wept over his children. He wept over his little baby who died. We don't even know that child's name. But he wept over his little baby who died. And Absalom, his son, who rebelled against him, tried to take his throne. When Absalom died, David wept. Why, well, he was a rebel. He was. He was cruel to his father. He was, and he was also cruel to his brothers. But David still loved him. Why? It was his son. It's his son. Now, I believe that most fathers love their children. Now, I'll be honest with you, it's apparent that some do not. Uh, I've seen some who just betray that which is natural and not only abandon their children, but just... And I'm not talking about the children left the father. I'm talking about dad left the children. But in that story I shared with you earlier, even that could be reconciled. Yeah, but if you knew my old man, but I don't. I don't know your old man, do I? God does. 
Well, maybe somebody's sitting there thinking, yeah, if you knew my kid, <laughs> well, yeah, maybe you got a case there too. People can be very cruel. People can be, be very cold. But I think most fathers love their children. And the love that a father has for his children is a small scale picture of the love that the heavenly father has for his children. Now there are many pictures in the Bible of fathers who love their children. There were fathers who brought their children to Jesus to be healed. And then there's the father of the prodigal son in Luke 15, 11 to 32. And this father loved both his sons. One of his sons was a rebel. He was self-centered and he wasted his substance with riotous living. I've, I've seen people do that. I have seen in my time, and I'm gonna give you three examples that we could go on, but I think you'll be able to relate with these three. I've seen somebody who inherited a lot of money, a lot of money, and in a year, they were broke and homeless. How did that happen? I've seen a man who, as a result, and, and I'm not saying he didn't deserve to get this, but as a result of an accident which involved a lawsuit, he received a huge settlement, a lot of money, should have been set for life. And in a year, he didn't have a dime. I've seen a man and this is, this is probably going to be the hardest one to believe who won the lottery twice. And I've seen him have nothing. Nothing. Now, folks, hear me. These are not people I read about or heard about on TV or on the Internet. Or so. These are people I knew personally. All three of those scenarios. What happened? Well, what happened is they wasted their substance, just like the prodigal son. Do you ever see any of those people? Well, two out of the three, yeah, I do. The third one I haven't heard from in many years. Don't know where he is or even if he's still walking on the planet or tell you the truth. Wouldn't mind hearing from him, but I haven't. But what about the other two that you do hear from? Don't you think they're just terrible, awful people? You, you know what? No, they realize their mistakes. And they've seen the love of God in their life. And they've seen God work in their life. They get their money back? No. And I'm quite sure they never will. But they've got God back in their life. So one of these two sons in the parable that Jesus gives in Luke 15 was self-centered. And he wasted his substance, all his money his father had left him with riotous living. But his dad still loved him. And then there's the other son. He was not like the rebellious son. He was not like the self-centered son. He did not waste his substance with riotous living. But he was a self-righteous man. He was always near home. But he would not forgive. He wouldn't forgive his brother. And he thought his father was unfair. After the younger son had gone out and wasted all of the money that he wasted. His father not only welcomed him back into the family. Not only welcomed him back home. But threw a big party for him. And the older son said, what, what's going on with that? I'm here. And he had been. I've worked hard. And he had. You didn't throw a big party for me. Remember what the father said? He said to him, he said, your younger brother was dead, but now he's alive. He's come home. And you know what else he said to the older son who had been there all the time? Hear what he said. He said, all that I have is thine. And you think that through for a minute. That's right. See, the younger son had already gotten his inheritance. So what's left who does that go to? It goes to that older son. All that I have is thine. Do you know what God says to you and I as his children? 
We are heirs and joint heirs with Christ. We are heirs to all that God has. What should our attitude be? Well, first of all, it ought to be grateful. But besides that, it ought to be love. Well, aren't they the same thing? Not necessarily. Haven't you ever expressed gratitude to somebody that you didn't necessarily love? Maybe you didn't even know them. A stranger does you a favor. What do you say? You say, oh, I love you so much. Well, I know some people who probably would say that. They'd say that to pretty much everybody. And that's fine. But most people aren't going to say that. Most people aren't going to say this stranger did them a favor. Oh, I love you so much. Well, what are you going to say? Thank you. Thank you. So you're grateful. But you're not pouring out love on that person. Now, again, some would. And I'm not criticizing those folks. That's fine. But the point is, you're going to be great, grateful whether you actually love that person or not. So the story of the prodigal son, that father loved his sons. He loved both of them. But can we go a step farther? God, who we've already said, has some prodigal children. Some of God's children go astray. He still loves them. Now, we're finally going to get down to the text. So I sure hope you kept your Bible open all this time. That was the introduction. The sermon should be finished in about three hours. And uh, <laughs> chapter 3, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1. John says, Behold, behold. You know what that means? Sit up and take notice. Look, observe, see. Behold, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That's what John wants us, so earnestly he wants us to see. The manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. What manner of love is that? Well, he tells us here that we should be called the sons of God. I'm going to point something out to you. I'm not doing it to be critical. I'm not doing it to point, pick on anybody. I'm doing it to help you understand truth. There are more English versions of the Bible today than I could tell you about right now. I can tell you half a dozen or more, but there's some I've never even heard of. And uh, something I've noticed over the last 30, 40 years is one of them gets real popular for a while, and then it's not so much, and another one gets to be real popular, and then that one's not, and then it's another one keeps changing. Now, there are reasons for that. Now, I'm not going to get into all the reasons why that keeps changing, but... I just want to point this one thing out to you. Many, not all, but many of the modern language translations of your Bible, your New Testament, when you come to the verse John 3, 16, it will say something like this. For God so loved the world, good, that he gave his only, no, not his only son, that he gave his one and only son, it will say, well, that's not right either. You see, Jesus isn't God's only son. He's certainly not God's one and only son. Well, how do you say that? I read that verse that we just read a moment ago. Look at it. Beloved, or I'm sorry, behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called what? Sons, sons of God. God. Well, my Bible doesn't say sons of God. It says children of God. Okay, fair enough. If it says children of God, are some of them sons? Yeah, same idea. Behold what manner of the love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. What a privileged title that is. Do you know what that makes you? Makes you a child of God. I read many years ago where the son of the emperor of Japan, they still have an emperor? Yeah, they do. Uh, I read where the son of the emperor of Japan lived a very unusual life. Why? Well, he's the son of the emperor, and he's going to be trained to dress a certain way. He's trained to act a certain way. He's trained to speak a certain way. He's trained with certain manners. There's certain conduct that he does not do, certain conduct that he must do, and he's very, very strictly trained all of his life. Why? Well, number one, he's the son of the emperor. Here's the other thing. One day, he's probably going to be the emperor. And that's what it's like to be the child of an emperor. What about being a child of God. You know, that's considerably more than being the child of an emperor. 
Empires come and go. The kingdom of God is forever. And to be a child of God, to be heir and joint heir with Christ is a blessing that's unique. It's unique to those who are the children of God. But let me show you something else about the manner of love God has shown on us. Look at chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. In verse 7 it says, Beloved, let us love one another. Now you've heard that all through Old Testament, New Testament. God says love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. What does that mean, love is of God? That means God is the source of love. Love comes from God. If you have love, guess where you got it from? You got it from God. Well, what about an unbelieving person? Can they love? Yes. You're telling me they got their love from God? Yes. Well, how can that be if they're unbelieving? Well, let me ask you this. How'd they get their breath? God gave it to them. How'd they get everything else about their being? God gave it to them. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Well, that contradicts what you just said. No, it doesn't. What John is saying here, yes, the unsaved person can love somebody else, but the kind of love, the agape love that God has, that's, that's for the child of God. Now, not only is God the source of love, but watch this. He that loveth, verse 8, he that loveth not God, knoweth not God, for God is love. Back in verse 7, love is of God. Here in verse 8, God is love. What John is telling us in verse 8 is that not only is God the source of love, but God is the very definition of love itself. And Jesus Christ's entrance into this world was the love of God made visible to mankind. That's what he's telling us. Well, how do you know that? I read the next verse, verse 9. In this was manifested, made visible, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son, not his one and only son, not his only son, his only begotten son. You see, we are children of God by faith. We are children of God by creation of, of grace. We are children of God by salvation. We are children of God by adoption. But Jesus is God's only begotten Son. God sent His only begotten Son into the world. Why? That we might live through Him. Now, verses 9 to 11 of this passage tell us how the love of God is made visible to us. Verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him here in his love this is what it looks like want to know what love looks like here it is here in his love not that we love god but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation second time in this book he uses that word it means payment in full for our sins there's at least a couple of you sitting here this morning who do accounting work you know what it means paid in full Nothing else is due on that account. And that's what this word is saying. There's nothing else due on that account. There's an there's a old gospel song that says the old account was settled long ago. And that's right. He is the propitiation. He sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. That's what he said back in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. Verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now, that is a picture of the manner of love that God has bestowed upon us. Number one, that we should be called the sons of God. Number two, that because we are the children of God, the world doesn't know us or recognize us. Where would you get that? Go back to chapter 3. In verse 1 again. Beloved, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. What does it mean? The world knoweth us not 
because it knew him not. Listen to the Gospel of John. Don't turn there. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 10. You know what it says of Jesus? He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. They didn't recognize him. They didn't realize God was here. A young man said to me several years ago, well, if this God of yours is real, why doesn't he come to the earth and show himself? I said, he did. Mm -hmm. He did. He thought of it and said, you're talking about Jesus, aren't you? I said, right. It's exactly what I'm talking about, who I'm talking about. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So because we are the sons or children of God, the world doesn't know us or recognize us. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Look at chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. Why doesn't the world know him? Why doesn't the world know us? Why doesn't the world love him? Why doesn't the world love us? Chapter 2, verse 15. John says, love not the world. Wait a minute, preacher. You've been telling us God loves the world. Yes, that's the people of the world. Different concept here. The concept here is don't love the world system. You know, there's another old gospel song that says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. There's great truth in some of these old songs, I'll tell you. Verse 15, 1 John 2, 15 again. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Don't get caught up on things that are temporary. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And here's the problem with all that. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth or lives forever. Chapter 3 and verse 1 again. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Do you understand that? You're not going to be the child of God somewhere out in eternity. Now you are the child of God. The day you were born again, the day you were born spiritually, you became the child of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Right now. Look at chapter 5, if you will. Chapter 5 and verse 1. How do you become the child of God? Here it is. 1 John 5, 1. Whosoever, anybody, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Stop right there. I've explained this in this room many, many times. Let me explain it again to help your understanding. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Some people read that and they don't get it. What do you mean, believes that Jesus is the Christ? Well, first thing you have to understand is Christ is not Jesus' name. I said that here one time. A guy wrote me a letter about it. He says, I challenge that statement. You, you got it wrong and so forth. So I wrote him back and I said, no, I stand by that statement. Here's why. Christ is not his name. I used to, when I could go into the bank, I haven't been able to go into the bank now for about three months or so, but when I used to be able to go into the bank, I used to like it because I'd walk in the door. And as soon as I walk in the door, somebody says, hey, jerk, what are you doing in here? No, they didn't. You know what? As soon as I walk in the door, hello, Mr. McClure, how are you today? They call me by name. You know what? I'm not a celebrity. I'm not world famous, but those people know my name. You know what? It makes me feel good. So why are you telling us that? I'm telling you that to tell you Jesus, when he was on earth, never walked into anywhere where somebody said, Hello, Mr. Christ. How are you today? Never happened one time. Why not? It's not his name. It's his title. And that title is that of the anointed one, the sent one, the Christos in Greek or the Mashiach, or the Messiah from the Hebrew. It is the title of the Savior. So when John writes and he says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, 
It's, he's not saying, if you believe that once upon a time there was a man walked the earth and his name was Jesus Christ. That is not what he's saying. He's saying, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Savior is born of God. Now, let me qualify that. John doesn't mean this either. Somebody said, do you believe that God had a son? I did before I ever knew the Lord. I believe God had a son. If they said, you believe his name is Jesus? Sure, I believe that. Um, do you believe he's the Savior? Yeah, I guess. Didn't really know what a Savior was, what you needed one for, or who had one and who didn't. Didn't know any of that. Boy, you're ignorant. Yeah, absolutely. So the fact of the matter is, if you'd said, do you believe he's the Savior? I'd say, sure, I guess. Guess that goes with it. I didn't know what that meant. You know why I didn't know what? Because he wasn't at that point my Savior. He was the Savior of the world. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, but he's not your Savior until you trust him to save you. And that's what John's saying here. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Savior, if you believe that he is your Savior, is born of God. Jesus said to Nicodemus, ye must be born again. How do you get born again? You believe that Jesus is your Savior. And everyone that loveth him that begot, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Look at verse 2, 1 John 5, 2. By this we know that, the, that we love the children of God. How? Number one, when we love God. Number two, when we keep his commandments. Solomon writes the book of Ecclesiastes, and he writes it from a human point of view. And all the way through, Solomon sounds like a pessimist. Sounds like worst case scenario till you get to the very end. And what does he say at the very end? This is the whole duty of man. Fear God, keep his commandments. What is he saying right here? By this we know that we love the children of God. When? When we love God and keep his commandments. Same thing Solomon was saying. Verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. John chapter 14, Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. He's not saying... Keep my commandments to earn your salvation. He's not saying keep my commandments to be better than other people. He's saying if you love me, show your love for me by keeping my commandments. That's what he's saying. This is the love of God, verse 3, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our strength. Is that what it says? It doesn't. Even our wisdom, is that what it says? No. Even our impressive numbers, no. Our great accomplishments, doesn't say any of that, does it? What does it say? This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our what? Faith. Faith. Because it's not us, it's him. And what overcomes the world is when we trust him. Then verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Pretty clear. Pretty clear. Jesus is the Son of God. But go back to chapter 3 again. And look at what it says in verse 2. Chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Who's the sons of God? We are. And let's go on in verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Isn't that something? The knowledge that our sins forgiven, sins are forgiven, the knowledge that our souls are saved from hell, the knowledge that we have a home in heaven is wonderful. Who could ask for more than that? Your sins are forgiven, your soul is saved, you have a home in heaven. Who could ask for more than that? But you know what's great? He promises us even more. I, I wouldn't ask for more. That's way more than I deserve as it is. I'm happy with that. And yet, Lord, you got more for me? Yeah. Look at it. Verse 2 again. Beloved, now, right now, are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what it shall be. You know what he's saying? There's more coming, and it's better. How's it get better? It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, Jesus is coming again. When he comes, we shall be like him. 
Wow. Be like Jesus. I mention this name around here often, and I'm, I'm not ashamed of doing it. Old Dr. Monroe Parker was one of my uh, mentors. And towards the end of his life, I think he knew that he didn't have too many years left. And he said this. He said, I look forward to when I see Jesus. Because when I see him, I'm going to be like him. He said, I've been trying so hard to be like him for all these years, and I haven't made it yet. But when I see him, I'm going to be like him. And folks, that's you too. When you see him, you're going to be like him. You shall see him as he is. There's an old Christmas song that was written uh, many years ago by Alfred Burt. Alfred Burt lived 1920 to 1954. Do the math real quick. He didn't live to be an old man. Why not? I don't know. But you'll know the song. I'm not going to sing it because I'm not a singer, but I'm going to share the words with you because it's such a beautiful picture of what John is teaching us here. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Every one of us has a mental picture of Jesus. Every one of us has an idea in our mind what he looks like. And it's not going to be the same for each one of us. But when he comes, we're going to see him as he is. And our faith shall be sight. And we'll finally be like him. You know this song. And this is just fine. This is how different ones of us imagine Jesus. Some children see him lily white. The baby Jesus born this night. Some children see him lily white with tresses soft and fair. Some children see him bronzed and brown, the Lord of heaven to earth come down. Some children see him bronzed and brown with dark and wavy hair. Some children see him almond-eyed, the Savior whom we kneel beside. Some children see him almond-eyed with skin of yellow hue. Some children see him dark as they, sweet Mary's son to whom we pray. Some children see him dark as they, and ah, they love him too. The children in each different place will see the baby Jesus' face like theirs, but bright and heavenly grace and filled with holy light. O oh, lay aside each earthly thing, and with thy heart as offering, come worship now the infant king. Tis love that's born tonight. You know what? That's a beautiful illustration of what John's saying. That we all have our image of him. We all have our picture of what he looks like. But one day, we're going to see him as he is. Now, is he going to look like I imagine? I don't know. I don't know how you imagine. But I know this. You're going to see him as he is. And <laughs> it's even better. When you do, when you see him as he is, you're going to be like him. You're going to be like him. Verse 3, and we're finished. And every man that hath this hope in him. Every man that hath this hope in him, in himself, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. The hope that we will see him as he is, the hope that we'll be like him, that hope motivates us today to live as pure a life as we possibly can until that day when we will truly be like him. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, doth not yet appear what we shall be. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Chapter 4, verse 9. In this was manifested made visible the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Chapter 5, verses 11 to 13, very quickly. And this is the record. That God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God that you may know not guess, hope so, maybe so. You may know that you have eternal life. 
and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can know that you have eternal life. You know why? Because of the love of the Father. Have you believed in Jesus? Have you been saved? Do you love him because he first loved you? Are you growing to be like him? Are you pointing others to him? Bill Rice Ranch put out a, a dramatic movie years ago. Very good. If you've never seen it, I, I'd encourage you to see it. It's called When Silence Speaks. It's the story of a, a deaf man named Gordy. And Gordy wasn't a bad guy, but he didn't know the Lord. And one day somebody conveyed to Gordy the gospel and Gordy trusted Jesus and was saved. And he wanted to witness. He wanted to, other people to know Jesus and be saved. But he couldn't hear and he couldn't speak. So he fashioned a large cross and stood it up on a hill beside a road. And then he would stand out on the road and as cars came by, he'd wave them down and stop and he would point to the cross. Just point to the cross. You know what he was doing? What you and I need to do. We need to point people to the cross. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Don't you think God would like to have a few more? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that we come to you and call you our Heavenly Father. You are our blessed comforter. You are our